ZTE created a yeah. uh, an, a uh, a card or the or I guess the microchip check technology in a card called the Fatherland card, and the Fatherland card is very similar to the social credit system because what they do is the 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 Fatherland card, which I guess is digital now, it uh, that is your that is your ticket to getting very heavily subsidized goods. But in exchange, like I mentioned earlier, it has your social credit history, it knows your voting patterns, it knows your uh, uh, well, I guess your credit score, all information that can be used against you can be leveraged and in many instances. Right now, you probably all know what's going on in Venezuela. And uh, I also wanted to share some information on the ground and to talk more to the people uh, from Venezuela who know and who understand what's going on there. So today I have invited Rafael uh, to my show. Rafael, could you please briefly introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, my name is Rafael Struve. I am a Venezuelan American. I'm here in the United States. My whole family, though, is from Venezuela. So obviously very, very in tune with what's been going on in the situation on the ground. And just like every other Venezuelan, hoping that tomorrow is a brighter day and that we finally see democracy prevail in our country. Thank you so much. Uh, well, to start today's interview, because uh, nobody probably is uh, so well informed about the Venezuelan politics. And uh, right now there is a lot of different information. There are some countries that uh, don't agree with the election results. There are some countries mostly totalitarian that support Maduro and they don't think that the um, election was stolen. Could you please briefly tell us about the political system in Venezuela, about the elections and about those uh, uh, accusations of the stolen election that come from the opposition. Yeah, absolutely. So Venezuela is a very un has a very unique political system that was at one point democratic. However, once Hugo Chavez, the uh, the president that came into power in 1999, changed the constitution and granted more powers. Uh, stripping them away from other institutions and granting them to the presidency, he started to slowly amass power. And one by one, the institutions started to become less um, representative of the different factions of the country and more loyalist. Okay. So there were different instances where they were they went from being uh, doubtful to just full on authoritarian. And I think. Uh, the best example of that was back in 2017 when Chavez is where Nicolas Maduro came into power and uh, well, he came into power in 2013 after Hugo Chavez passed away. But in order to solidify his power, he not only militarized the the uh, the country, which means that he granted more power in terms of managing different institutions and parts of the economy to the to the generals and high ranking members of the um, of the Venezuelan military. But also, he ended up dissolving effectively the power of the National Assembly because the National Assembly, which is, I guess, the United States version of Congress, had the one. Of, yeah. Yes, it's it's kind of like Parliament. Exactly. And so the Parliament in 2015 was a representative of all the different democratic parties that made up what was that we consider the the opposition opposition parties okay. and because they had a majority they would have effectively stopped maduro from being able to usurp all power so what nicolas maduro did is he created what's called a constituent national assembly which effectively supersedes the power of the national assembly and renders the political power moot. And the the body of the Constituent National Assembly is entirely made up of loyalists uh, who are completely loyal to Nicolas Maduro. Not only that, back in um, just slowly but surely over the past couple of years, the National Assembly itself was co-opted by the uh, the Socialist Party, which is the party of Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. Political parties themselves were co-opted by the Maduro regime. And so they had fake um, candidates that I guess are part of the opposition in name. But really what they're doing is they're they're almost in, in a costume. They're, they're playing the role of a of an opposition figure in order to show the the world internationally that there is opposition. But that's not the case. And so it's not like China or like Cuba, where it's a one party state, um, technically, but in rule and in functionality, it most certainly is. So it's more like a 
hybrid authoritarian regime. Do you think that there are any differences between Maduro, who is Chavez's successor, and Chavez's rule? Because there were many accusations also before, and there are also protests against Hugo Chavez. Uh, but right now, the, probably the clashes are the most brutal. What do you think are the biggest differences between the Chavez's rule and Maduro's rule? I think the, the biggest difference is the lack of charisma. Um, Nicolas Maduro, okay. really, he's a strong man, but he didn't have the sort of charisma as a as a popular figure that Hugo Chavez did. Hugo Chavez came into power primarily because he was able to identify the grievances of the people at that time. And so he was very overwhelmingly popular. Uh, well, at least for those who voted for him. But in all fairness, he did win a, a large majority of the vote in, in 1998 before he came into power in 1999. I think the other big difference is that he probably was a little bit smarter in the sense that he would have known not to maybe double down on a lot of okay. the the far-sighted and really, I think, repressive um really repressive and outright totalitarian tactics that the regime has been implementing. It's almost the best comparison I could make is almost like Vlad. Um, I would say that Hugo Chavez was more like a Vladimir Lenin and Hugo and, uh, and Nicolas Maduro is more like a Joseph Stalin where they, okay. they in, th in theory, they implement the same idea, but one of them is far more brutalist in nature. And I think that the militarization of the country has been much um, stronger under uh, under Nicolas Maduro's rule. And uh, talking about Venezuelan opposition, do they get a lot of support on the ground? Because right now it is said that the election is stolen. Was it a vote for a real opposition or mostly the vote against Maduro? C can you give like your, your insight on that? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So historically, the opposition has been very fractured. There have been different movements throughout the throughout the years over the past decade and a half, really two decades to try and either coexist with the with the regime under Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro or outright movements to try and oust him. And I think over the years, there have been different attempts. There have been different times where the regime has gone to the negotiating table with the opposition. And the opposition is made up of four or five different political parties. Each of them tend to range in, I think, seriousness and I think to some degree um, complicitness in allowing for this regime to survive. I think there, in the traditional opposition, there have been some really strong figures that have uh, really risked everything to try and uh, force real change. But at the same time, you have folks who I think are bought off, who are paid under the table to try and maybe not not necessarily whitewash what the regime does, but maybe to make them seem not as bad or to make the case that maybe we should just learn to live with them. But in the case of this particular opposition figure, the opposition figure that everybody has been rallying around, her name is Maria Karina Machado. Now, Maria Karina Machado is a figure that has been around for over two decades and has been one of the loudest voices against both Nicolas Maduro and Hugo Chavez. She's more of a libertarian at heart, has always advocated for things that socialism doesn't, right? Like private property, free market uh, rules and regulations, privatization, things that would make a country like Venezuela prosperous. She was one of the strongest uh, voices and people in the opposition, a lot of them just did not want to follow her lead. They thought that she was too extreme because most opposition uh, political parties are actually center left uh, ideologically, okay. whereas um, her party, Vente Venezuela, is more to the right, more libertarian leaning. And so when um, when she tried to run for president, um, she went through a primary process and overwhelmingly won, I think, by 80 percent of the vote in the primary to be the opposition nominee against Nicolas Maduro, who was running for reelection. But she was disqualified. The reason she was disqualified is because uh, Maduro, what he will do is he will pass these laws, these anti-terrorism laws to disqualify okay. candidates, basically saying that they're traitors or they've been found to commit acts of terrorism or conspiring to commit acts of terrorism. And so because of that, they will use these these um, meaningless and honestly false charges in order to disqualify them from running. So what happened was this. 
Um, there was an older gentleman whose name is Edmundo Gonzalez. Edmundo Gonzalez is a very little known figure who at one point was the ambassador of Argentina. Now, he managed to get his name onto the presidential ballot before the applications closed because Maria Crina Machado wasn't able to get there. And basically everybody else, there were about six other candidates, but all of those other candidates were compromised by the regime and they were put there again to to present to this to the world this mirage that there is opposition when that's not really the case and so when people went to the uh, to the polls maria karina machado told the world look i can't run but i want you to put your faith in edmundo gonzalez because i'm standing with him and if i'm standing with him you should be standing with him too because maria karina machado has become very much a figurehead of the opposition of resilience of hope of this, uh, this, this strength that I think for many years in Venezuela had been lost because people thought that the fight was over because of all the, these different attempts throughout the years for the opposition to try and oust the Maduro regime. So what ended up happening is that uh, people came out in droves despite the fact that people could not vote internationally. I myself couldn't vote even though I'm a Venezuelan citizen. My parents couldn't vote. A lot of people around the world, 8 million that have left in the past 10, 12 years, they were not yeah. able to vote. And um, in spite of that, in spite of voter intimidation tactics, um, there was, I believe, a, a 60 to 70 percent voter turnout. And in that, um, the the opposition calculates that Edmundo Gonzalez has won by a two to one ratio. So he has roughly over 60 percent of the vote, whereas Maduro has 30 percent of the vote. The problem is that it was absolutely unequivocally well, stolen. They, to this day, have yeah. not released the results. Um, in fact, every single day since Sunday, the uh, the Electoral Council, which is the, the regulatory body for, uh, for the elections in Venezuela, has pledged to host a press conference where they will announce the results. Every single day at the very last minute, they have suspended um, or called off at the very last minute that press conference. And so they have not released official results. The night of the results, they they put out a um, they put out false numbers that were that that reported in exit polls over 107 percent of the vote, which is mathematically impossible. In fact, there's a there's a Columbia journalist who said earlier today that mathematically there is a one in 100 million chance that the numbers would be in enough and in favor of uh, Nicolas Maduro to have won the vote. And so that's where we're at. Wow. And this is actually so similar to what has been going on uh, in Belarus four years ago, when also there was an opposition candidate who was imprisoned, actually, before the election, and his wife ran instead of him. Like, basically, that situation with Edmundo Gonzalez, but that there was a lady who presented the opposition at the time, and she also won during those elections, but the government, the, the dictator of Belarus, he didn't admit it. And then there were also clashes with the police. They also hired like Russian police to crack on the Belarusian opposition to the people who took on the streets. Uh, I mean, the methodology and the ways how do those authoritarian countries treat their people, it's so similar all around the world, in Eastern Europe okay. or... In South America, like that's, well, that's because terrible. they come from the same, they come from the same source. In fact, uh, something else I forgot to mention to you, Stan. Yeah. Uh, Venezuela is yeah. part of a this authoritarian collective. They are very much bolstered and supported, both militarily and diplomatically, by not just Russia, but by China, by Iran, by, China. by Cuba. Yeah. Yes, China has uh, has been very instrumental in providing the blueprint, the framework for digital repression. In fact, just just yesterday, uh, Nicolas Maduro unveiled on the app. There's there's a, an app on the Google Play Store that Venezuelans have to use in order to um, in order to get their subsidies, because many, uh, many folks who are lower class, they rely on government subsidies to survive. But in exchange, yeah. they have to give their identity. They have to give their bank account statements, their their medical history and now there's a feature on the app that he just released yesterday that allows for uh for users to be able to denounce uh fellow friends neighbors family 
if they speak badly about the regime, and that's actually a crime. So if you post a TikTok or if you post a social yep. media tweet, then you can use that app theoretically to denounce that person and report them to the authorities and they will come to your house and they will drag you from your home and then who knows what's happened. There are over a thousand people who have been kidnapped and have been abducted from their homes since this Sunday and many of them because of what I just described earlier. This is so much like that social credit score. If it goes too low, if you say something bad about the government, you probably will be locked into the prison camp. And there have been clashes with the authorities, with the police, with the Venezuelan army. I have seen those videos on uh, on X platform, on, on Twitter, when some of the soldiers decided to actually support the protesters and to join in. Because it has been for three days already. Uh, can you give us your insight? What is going on right now on the ground? And are there any chances that Maduro would step down? So I will say immediately, the immediate answer is no. He will never, ever, I think these elections prove, um, this is this has been described by economists, journalists, independent observers. In fact, let me actually just really quickly point out to your audience, the Carter yeah. Center, which is an independent electoral observer um, they, based here in the United States, was praised by the Maduro regime for years. They have been very much on the left and have certified... Yeah. Uh, one of the most credible certif certifiers of the election results. They themselves, they were praised by the Maduro regime. And just days later, they left the country. And the minute they left the country, they put out a report saying that these results that the Maduro regime posted cannot be verified. They seem false and they cannot and the elections cannot be concluded as democratic. And so it shows that Nicolas Maduro is willing to post uh, or stick by the most obscene odds in order to survive and i think that it's going to require unfortunately um him exiting by force now and absent any sort of notions or ideas of intervention the the most realistic option would be the military forces themselves stepping in and um and taking matters into their own hands the problem is that for many years um, Cuba came into Venezuela and they came into an agreement with Hugo Chavez, whereby Hugo Chavez heavily subsidized oil in, uh, exports to Cuba. And in exchange, Venezuela received military generals, play, uh, playbooks, basically uh, instruction manuals and guides on how to properly repress your people. So the infrastructure of the of the local uh, the local police, military forces counterintelligence, all of them were Cubanized, and now they resemble something like the Stasi of East Germany. And so okay. it's, yes, it's very difficult for soldiers like Basically the secret police. Yeah. Yes. Yes, very, very much secret police. And th there's footage all over um, for, for your audience. I highly recommend if you can find your, the, the footage, you can find them even, I, I've been reposting them on my social media and it's it's very, very sad to see. And cl these clandestine operations where in the in the dead of night or sometimes even during the day, these, uh, these, these men will come in just heavily guarded, heavily armed with riot shields, with uh, skull masks. They will go into these homes and they will drag people from their homes. They will kick in the door and they will just drag you from your sleep or, or whatever you're doing. And so what happens is uh, these the, the phones and the, um, the systems of communication of these people, of these um, soldiers, are constantly monitored. So they fear for their lives. They, they can't uh, they, they, I'm sure many of them are scared that if they even think about trying to um, rise up in an insurrection, they will be caught and then they will be thrown into prisons that are described as dungeons where there are all sorts of mm -hmm. uh, instances of torture that have been denounced by both the International Criminal Court and by the United Nations as as legitimate crimes against humanity. So I think on the, the situation on the ground right now has been mostly people in the opposition, uh, but even in areas where traditionally Maduro and Hugo Chavez have received a lot of support, um, people are rising up there as well, because I think that in du double digit uh, advantages were given to Anmundo Gonzalez. Everybody is tired of this regime. However, the arms, the ability to, to mobilize uh, the regime and his forces, they have the advantage. And so it's really up to the the mid-level uh, officers 
to rebel against the high command if there's any hope for uh, the high command, by the way, which is handsomely paid by the regime to not do anything. So it's up to them and the low infantry soldiers to make that choice if they want to continue being puppets of the regime or if they want to save the people. To take their freedom back, basically. Raphael, uh, the final question, because most of my viewers, they're Taiwanese. Do you know anything? I, I, I think that you know a lot about it, but can you just give a brief information on the cooperation between the Chinese Communist Party and the Venezuelan regime? And because right now in Taiwan, everyone is also concerned about the Chinese infiltration problem, like the network of Chinese spies, also the propaganda networks. It's most, it's most like that in Taiwan. But I see how the Venezuelan regime and the CCP, they are cooperating very closely. Can, can you give some examples what's going on in regards to China and Venezuela right now? Yes, of course, absolutely. So um, I think your audience would would re would absolutely appreciate everything that I've said because it, it hits home. I'm I'm not I'm certainly not an expert on Taiwan, but I, I absolutely support their um, their resistance against the CCP and to make sure that it preserves the democracy that they that they cherish and that is very much at risk. It's uh, it, it's tough because the CCP has, I think, in some ways been a model for the the Venezuelan regime to um, to replicate. When Hugo Chavez was first in power, he was very close with um, I can't remember who the who the president of China was before the uh, before the, the the current one. Hu Jintao, Hu Jintao. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, and um I cannot remember. The, this is so embarrassing. What is the name of the current president of China right now? Um, Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping. Ah, Xi Jinping. Yes. So yeah, uh, I mean, kind of using the word president is also a little bit because in Chinese oh, it's yeah. called the chairman. They didn't change the name of it, but they they have changed the English version of their constitution. And right now they're oh. forcing everyone to call their dictator a president. So so it sounds more democratic right. as if China was a democracy. But right. in Mandarin, it's called Zhu Xi, which means the chairman. So it was Chairman Hu, and right now it's Chairman Xi. Yeah, basically like that. All right. All right. So for your audience, I will say Chairman Xi. So yeah, uh, yeah, Hugo yeah. Chavez <laughs> and, and both Nicolas Maduro were both very close with uh, with their respective counterparts. Uh, Nicolas Maduro, Chairman Xi. Uh, back in 2017, I mentioned earlier that app on the Google Play Store. That app was actually created by, um, by, by, by software technicians in China, if I'm not mistaken. And I, it could actually go one step further. The, the subsidy program that, uh, uh, that provides... Um, Poor quality, I, I will say, but um, goods and and basic basic needs uh, that I think are usually unaffordable for for lower class Venezuelans. The app, in order to request those um, those the the refilling and, and those programs, was created by. Um, by ZTE, ZTE created a yeah. uh, an, a uh, a card or the or I guess the microchip ch technology in a card called the Fatherland card, and the Fatherland card is very similar to the social credit system because what they do is the 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 Fatherland card, which I guess is digital now. It uh, that is your that is your ticket to getting very heavily subsidized goods. But in exchange, like I mentioned earlier, it has your social credit history. It knows your voting patterns. It knows your uh, well, I guess your credit score, all information that can be used against you can be leveraged. And in many instances, it is like uh, banking data. Where do you get your money from and yes. so on and so forth? Yes. Yeah. In, in fact, th there are instances that are that have been proven of, um, of Venezuelans who for example, if they ha if they don't have the fatherland card, if they have the fatherland card and they vote in a certain way that is not in favor of the Maduro regime, what will happen is they will. If if you're in need, for example, of oxygen tanks, uh, or if you're in need mm -hmm. of oxygen, they will confiscate the oxygen tanks so that you can't get access to them because you are not afforded that luxury because you are not a, a loyal supporter of the Maduro regime. Even like the so, medical and, necessities, like like, yes. like like you said. Wow. 
Yes. Yes. Um, and of course that that's reserved for the people who have them and need them, but th that makes up so many people because of just the economic destruction that has taken place under both Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. And then the other thing I wanted to point out is that China has a very distinct relationship with Venezuela that is, I think, more transactional in comparison to the kind of relationship that it ha that Venezuela has, for example, with Russia or with Iran <laughs> or with Cuba, where the infiltration is much more direct. Um, China definitely sees Venezuela as a key trading partner because of the fact that they're banking or they're they're hoping that as long as Maduro stays around, they have a reliable trading partner and a foothold in the in the Western Hemisphere. I mean, they, they've already been constructing this Belt and Road Initiative throughout the yeah. Western Hemisphere, and Venezuela was really the start of it. And they've kind of taken a pause because of the because of the way the economy has been going. But it is uh, it's still a, a a fairly strong relationship and time and time again if it goes to the un if it goes to the security council china will always vote in favor of the maduro regime in fact they were one of the very first countries in the world to congratulate maduro for his fraudulent win this is this is very worrying and i really do hope that everyone pays attention to what's going on in venezuela right now one last question rafael if anyone can help venezuelan people what do you guys need mostly right now how can we live in abroad living like for example like you in the united states like um, i'm right now here in europe or people in taiwan who view my channel what can we do to help venezuelan people um i think the most important thing is to make sure that you are sharing content and you are letting if if you have um If you have a platform where you're able to spread information, share videos, share updates, um, just like in China, just like these these dem these autocratic regimes, totalitarian regimes, they work best in 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 silence and darkness because once they have created this disinformation apparatus, they're able to confuse people. They're able to say that Maduro's the good guy, that the United States is the bad guy, that the West is the is at the fault of everything that's going on. But what needs to happen is uh, people who are in charge, people who are diplomats, people who are figures uh, that have um, influence in public policy, they need to be the ones who can do who can share that information, but they have to see it on their own respective um, social media networks. And the other thing that's important is that m the more people see it, the more that people realize that Maduro is no longer the president. He lost. So Edmundo Gonzalez is the president elect of Venezuela. The problem is that we have this tyrant that refuses to leave. And as long as he is there, time is time is his biggest ally. And with all the things that are going around on around the world, with uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, with yeah. the with the war in Gaza. Uh, with all these other flashpoints of uh, around the world, Venezuela risks being at the bottom of the, um, I guess, the, the headlines for world news. And so we just need to keep it alive because it's it really is as dangerous as I'm making it sound. And it only makes uh, China's position, Russia's position, Iran's position, these totalitarian regimes, it makes their position stronger if people don't speak up and share this information about what's really happening in Venezuela. Anyway, to follow you on social media, I know that you have X account, which is pretty active. Uh, anywhere mm -hmm. else? Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm on X. My um, my account is Rafael R A F A E L E Struve S T R U V E. Um, I'm also on Instagram. I also have a podcast that I, I will admit I have not done in two years because I've been more focused on American politics. However, given just how much energy and how much movement there is in the Venezuela situation, my podcast is called The State of Venezuela Podcast. Um, it, there are about 20 different episodes where I, I have interviewed different activists, former politicians, former diplomats, journalists, academics, giving a more, um, a, a, I guess, a broader context and framing it for those who are not from Venezuela to give people a sense of what's really happening. So if you want to get caught up and really understand sort of the background of how we got here, highly recommend State of Venezuela podcast. And again, uh, follow me and uh, I, I will absolutely be sharing the right content and the right updates. Thank you so much. And I wish you all the best and wish all the best to the Venezuelan people. Stay strong. Thank you. Thank you, Sam.